Aloha and welcome to the one within all. You're listening to Interverse. Dear friends, with that being said, let's begin by reviewing some facts that we all know. Mainly that corporate social media sites like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the like are rife with censorship and suppression of the non-supported mainstream news paradigm. The likes we used to see as social currency are now so frequently purchased by real currency and inflated by bots that the problem has reached such an insane level that we've got literally factories of computers and smartphones that run automated software, all to inflate the popularity of products, politicians, and corporate interests. With the fascist merger of big telecom companies and government regulatory bodies like the FCC, it looks like the corporate cronies are signing the death knell for what little legislation exists to protect equality of access to online information. The Wild West days of true internet freedom may seem to be fading into the sunset, but my guest today has plenty of insight on solutions to that very problem. As the founder of Eureka.org, a free speech and heart-based social media website, and a prolific blog writer on esoteric topics of every flavor. This being has both knowledge on humanity's current situation and the wisdom to speak the truth and effect positive changes in others. So please join me in blasting some high quality love energy towards the pineal gland of my fantastic friend who goes by the name You're a Soul. He's returning to the podcast for a second appearance. And last time we had a great deal of interesting material to discuss from animal telepathy and communication to understanding the psychological dynamics of they and us, channeling spiritual wisdom from higher dimensional entities, and the all-encompassing importance of acting out of a balanced place, which is our heart. Make sure to check out the ever-growing repository of free human expression at eureka.org and his blog on Steemit, both of which will be linked here in the show notes. And I encourage you to create a profile on either of those places and say hello to us. Welcome back to Interverse, my friend. Hey, Chaz. Good to good to be back. Thanks for having me back. Yes. Yeah, so I've been keeping up with you for the entire time that we've uh, last since we last spoke listening to or reading all your articles that I can get my eyes upon. And sometimes there's some extremely insightful stuff that I've never thought through. And even whenever my first instinct is, oh, I kind of already know about this subject. I can just skim it. I find that you typically dig out some gems and some wisdom of perspective that are useful to me, no matter what the subject matter is. So I'll start by thanking you for all that excellent writing you've been putting out there. Thank you very much. Thanks for thanking me. Thanks for reading. I mean, it's it's great to know that you've read what I've been putting out and that's why I do it. So uh, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, If you guys want to check out a lot of his writing, it's collected both on Eureka and in a very nice format of recent stuff on Steemit. And Steam, it's something I've kind of dabbled in, but I've not had really any success in actually <laughs> connecting with a lot of people on there. And I, I'm curious maybe to get your thoughts on it, because I've seen you have some definite success with your posts on a, on a numerical level. But how do you feel about the community at large? Do you think it has a lot of people looking to actually engage with what you're doing? Or is it more bot oriented and trying to drive up? people's personal cryptocurrency scores or is it kind of a balance of both of those things yeah i mean i I think the fact that it's intended to be somewhat anarchic means that it really is that so it's everything it's it's everything you just said and probably other things that i've not even seen um there's definitely i would say that in in the last nine months since i've really been using it or roughly that length of time uh i've seen less and less obvious exploitation going on in terms of wealthy people voting each other up and doing really weak posts and just trying to get money that way. Uh, but there's definitely more bots on there and there's, you know, there's, there's more of that kind of thing going on. So it's just, if you give people a, a tool to exploit, to make money, then they're going to exploit it and make money basically. So there's, it's difficult to see a way around that really, other than by being really strict with the rules and the rules aren't strict because it's meant to be a kind of anarchic place. So um, it's hard, to, you know. I think that the conclusion from everyone I've spoken to who's really thought about this is you just have to make the best of it and 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 do what you can to to succeed if that's what you're looking for. Um, in terms of the, the people on there, uh, there's a wide variety again, and it's. Um, I found that I've made really good connections with some people more so than more so in numbers and maybe to some extent quality than I have on other big social networks in the last year, um, like Facebook and other places. Um, so I'm quite happy with that aspect to it. And, and 
the reputation side of it means that people do kind of get forced to up their communication skills and their kind of friendliness a little bit because they don't want to lose their reputation and lose the possibility of losing money. And so it's a bit of a strange and slightly forced situation, but at the same time, to be honest, it, it, I actually prefer it to a lot of the bigger sites where there seems to be some sort of com competition to see who can be the most antisocial sometimes. So, um, uh, right on. I, I personally <laughs> have that problem right now with social media is that I don't feel like, I feel like the amount of time that I put into it for the amount of real human connection that emerges from it is a poor ratio, unfortunately. Yeah. And maybe it's because a lot of my emphasis is really more on just trying to get the things that I'm created creating out there in as many places as possible more than I am looking to have a conversation. But I guess I'm kind of just waiting for people to come to me and you know, the, it's a reciprocity thing with social media, just with all social interactions. And I probably ought to be getting out there and reading people's work more, looking at their, um, looking at their stuff and actually saying, you know, it's it kind of the old thing. If I treat others how you want to be treated. So if I want people to write some nice comments on my <laughs> posts, I really should probably do more of that myself. I kind of figured out my own problem there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's what I've learned along all of this time I've been using social media it, as you exactly what you just said. And it, and it really is a case of, it doesn't take a whole lot of time just to, to go out there and put out rather than just wait to receive. And I think that makes a big difference. I think the thing with Steam it for me was that I posted about a hundred posts on there and made almost no money and got almost no engagement or anything. And they're all quite, you know, fairly good posts. Um, I was just testing it all. But what I really realized is that you have to get support from people who are already established on the network before you're going to actually get more and more people paying attention to you because there's so many posts on there that the chances are that of you being seen by anyone in particular are quite small. Um, so, I, basically, yeah, that's you have to start that ball rolling by by going out and talking to people and writing intelligent comments, and you you know you're going to get some upvotes just for the comments, and you can that's another good thing about Simi, you get paid for your comments as well, so um, you can actually you know if, if time is money for you, which you, I'm not sure that that's how you really look at things at all, but for, for other people maybe um, at, at least you can actually you know start to see some success just from talking to people, which is awesome, I think. Yeah, and the fact that it's a decentralized blockchain currency that's emerging there is also really cool. I like seeing the multiplicity of digital currencies as opposed to so much energy putting, being put towards just one thing like Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, uh, cryptocurrencies is something that I've been studying a bit more in the last few months. I wasn't really that interested in it in the past because uh, I still... Back then, and I still do now, want to reach a point where we don't have any currencies of any kind. But in the interim, um, this is an interesting exploration. And um, if it helps me do what I need to do in the meantime without having to go do things I don't want to do, um, then that's a good thing from my perspective. And, um, so, yeah, but Steam, Steam is like the fastest, technically the fastest currency, I think, at the moment. Uh, if, not one, if it's not the fastest, it's one of the fastest. So, in other words, it does more transactions per day than Bitcoin. Um, and all these other sort of major ones. So there's a good chance that that and also EOS, which is the new system that's going to come out next year by the same guy that invented Steam, um, are going to really kind of take over things. So, What's um, that system going to be oriented around? It's totally different again. It's, I mean, I haven't used it, so you know, I'm speculating a little bit, and there's a lot of information. I've read some of it. But in short, it's a... It's called EOS, and it is a distributed operating system. So in the same way that, um, or in a similar way to the way that Steam and Steamit are a distributed social network, uh, EOS is a distributed operating system. So you can actually run applications on it, and you can run your own website on it. And essentially, as I understand it anyway, it, it can replace hosting. It can replace website hosting. It can replace, um, I mean, Dan uh, Larimer, I think is how you pronounce his name, the guy who invented it and the guy who invented Steam, uh, he's quoted as saying, basically, he wants EOS to make governments irrelevant. That, that's how he describes it. And so it actually has um, some kind of courts, not court system, but like an arbitration system in it. So, and contracts. So if people default on the contracts, it goes through arbitration. You don't have to go to court and get a lawyer and all this stuff. I really don't know how that's going to work, but it sounds pretty interesting. Yeah, I think the more complete transparency we can bring to our dealings with each other, the quicker we'll get away from this need for currency. Like, 
you were saying you want to move away from that concept entirely. Well, so do I, because to me, like looking at it from, as you like to call it, the heart centered perspective or heart balanced perspective, what are we really doing with this entire game of commerce that we're playing? How is it any different than monopoly where you viciously try to get as much wealth extracted out of the people around you who are theoretically your friends and family that you're playing with as you can. And we are all one human family and we're all capable of being friends with each other. So if that's the case, why are we trying to extract wealth out of one another for goods and services instead of just providing for each other the things that the other one needs based on what we have in surplus? And that's such a foreign and alien concept to the Western civilizational model or lack of civilization, if you ask me, that we currently have right now. But in the past, there was such a thing as just open and pure hospitality to the stranger and people would let each other into their homes, travelers, and cook them a meal. And there's so much lost to our shared human- humanity in this current age that if we could maybe create these sort of dynamic, self-sufficient communities, like through Steemit, we might see that trickle down into the physical world and maybe have an, a reemergence of a, a tribe type mentality, but not in a divisive way, but in a sort of a, like in a Celtic way where you had many tribes and you could go from tribe to tribe as a free man. And yeah, there's, there's a lot our ancestors knew that we've totally ditched. And I think it's time that we bring our piece of the creation novelty, which is all this technology into a perspective that considers the wisdom of, you know, what's come before and uh, start getting rid of this cult of authority and replace it with a a cult of personal responsibility and sovereignty. Awesome. Perfectly said. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, um, I I talk quite regularly in various like anarchy groups on Facebook and places like that. And one of them I like, actually, I recommend people check out if they're on Facebook is called compassionate anarchy. Um, and that really is, that's the only real form of anarchy to me is you can't really have anarchy without compassion because then it turns into the image that people have been told that anarchy is of, of kind of, destruction and competition and conflict and uh, chaos. yeah i mean if you want to call it that yeah and, and compassion is is the solution to all those problems and so you need that to, to have anarchy um but in those groups i find people who haven't quite grasped this idea and what you've just said at all and i have to explain what you've just said almost word for word to many people regularly um sometimes they go silent and sometimes they'll just talk about market forces, or they'll say, maybe I'm a communist. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, uh, at least there's only so many arguments and mistakes that people have in their head about these ideas. So once you understand them, you can quite, quite readily respond to them, which is a good thing. Um, yeah, well, if people are at least entering that conversation like- there, then that's a good that's a good step. You know, the, it's kind of like the old joke that a uh, Libertarian, which is one of the small government oriented third parties in the United States, that a libertarian is just um, a week and a few good books away from being an anarchist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a lot of different discussions about, I mean, you've got um, anarcho capitalist, anarcho communist, anarcho blah, 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 blah. blah. Um, and it seems like the people who actually really have thought about this realized that you can't really have those other flavors of anarchy in a sense because anarchy right. is just the absence of a ruler uh that's it so it's i mean like i would add compassion into that but but if you've got like capitalist anarchy well capitalism is owning things and yeah you can own things without having a ruler but the more you own things the more you start to dominate everything and basically you become a kind of ruler whether you like it or not so it's kind of it's difficult for me to 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 accept that as being a valid approach to these dynamics. And yet we're forced to accept that because that's what we have. Basically the closest, it, like just from using steam, it, I was excited because it's the closest I've ever come really to experiencing something akin to anarchy. And it's, and it's a capitalist form of that. And I still like it because it has that freedom to it. And it, you know, it got me excited, but um, we can definitely do a lot, a lot better than that. And it, but it's going to take a real major shift of, of everything for that to happen. Yeah, the major shift is the shift to the personal responsibility that's necessary for anarchy to exist. Like you said, the meaning of the word is no rulers. It it doesn't mean chaos the way that people are culturally conditioned to think it means. But 
if there's no external rulers, how do you create that state of being not controlled by anything external? You have to be in complete uh, personal sovereignty, which is not really the same thing as self-control, more like you're aligned with your true will and yeah. that you're not acting out of uh, fear. So fear that you, like you so perfectly put it in the article about fear that you wrote recently, that fear is just a... Uh, perception of the loss of personal power in a sense and power and responsibility going hand in hand means that if you have a full awareness of your personal power which is basically that you are a limitless infinite creative aspect of the entire universe that's embodied in a singular point of perspective then you also are completely responsible for everything that you experience and that you do and that you create and that's how you get away from the, con the the state of external rulership and control because another aspect of being in your in recognition of your own personal uh, infinite worth or value is that you love yourself as well and that's the the main obvious correlate between control and and freedom is that when what love does is creates the state of freedom and the recognition of the, those higher potentials and what control is, is the, the fear side of things is the external manifestation of the internal fear. So yeah, the, the real work is all of us eliminating that in our own internal kingdom, so to speak. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. It's uh, everything starts inside and, um, the universe is very complex. We're quite complex, but complexity is a whole bunch of simplicity stuck together. So as long as you can come back to that and keep it simple, stupid, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so all that is really needed is like conscience then, basically. Yeah, really, yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's you have to have the understandings needed to go with that, it, you know, and that, it's all self-reinforcing, isn't it? So you, you learn one thing, you realize the benefit of that, you, you make a change. And people, a lot of people who, who, who understand these things don't like science. They kind of say, oh, science has caused all these problems, and the science, you know, it's a, it's a big failure. It, it doesn't really achieve what we need, but... I still like the idea of science and, and I think maybe I just think of it a bit differently to some people, but to me, science is the scientific method. And that basically means you come up with a hypothesis, an idea about what might be true or what is true. And you run some tests, you do things, you experiment and you find out if it's true or not. And everyone's doing that all the time. Anyway, it's not really like this amazing kind of carved in stone tablet that you have to be given a special ceremony for you to be able to do these things it's kind of like well you you were doing it since you were born pretty much so um so from that perspective i like to i like to think in terms of of, of science as being a good thing and i like to integrate that into um these processes um and i think there's a place for that kind of spiritual science basically which is really just the process of self-evolution and coming into balance in, in a sense yeah, and that's also part of personal responsibility is taking control of your own epigenetic development because at the level of intelligence that we have reached as a species, we're not really being guided by nature as much in our evolution. The automatic part of the process that kind of led us to this point where animals sort of live in a smaller, reduced degree of freedom than humans obviously have because of their lower level of complexity and intelligence, that means our evolution is therefore going to be selected by the environment we create for ourselves, both externally and both internally in consciousness. Yeah, and, I yeah. agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sorry, you, you, do you have something on that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, you just triggered, triggered the thought of evolution in me. And, and really, yeah, I was just going to reiterate that the evolution is that th this is one of the things that I have with science is that is that although I love science, science is great. There's also a lot of bad science, and there's a lot of really kind of poor logic that's been used in defining the, the ideas that we've been taught are absolute foundations of reality. Uh, and the idea of the theory of evolution and these kind of things, th there are some, from my perspective, there are aspects of those which are correct, and and I agree with them. But but ultimately, as you're pointing to, evolution is an internal process. It, it, everything starts with our will, in a sense. It's, it, everything is willed. So evolution is not really so much, from my perspective, the result of um, random occurrences and, and chance, uh, although when I say chance, I mean chance as in potential rather than you personally. Um, <laughs> um, it, you know, it's, it comes down to an act of will. And so do I want this to happen? Do I want that to happen? 
yes, I want that to happen. Okay, well, how am I going to do that? Well, I need to change this, I need to do that. And that, that's evolution. That's guided, conscious, intent-based evolution as opposed to random occurrences. And the random occurrences have a role in evolution too, but they're not really an optimal pathway to success, obviously. So um, I think that's what's really hugely missing from a lot of people's kind of thoughts on these subjects. Yeah, from what I understand about Darwin, he was even taking the concept of evolution from occult uh, ideas of spiritual evolution that we're talking about right now, which is the spiraling outward of consciousness in form into ever increasing levels of complexity. And so Darwin, of course, took that idea and looked at the natural world and thought, well, that might apply to how animals develop over time into different versions of themselves. And that seems very to have plenty of evidence to support that. But uh, the the real negative side effect of his work is that it was used as a excuse to have this concept of social Darwinism, the strong survival of the fittest, you know, and I don't think really nature actually works that way. I think nature isn't about survival of the most ruthless. It's about survival of what works best in its community as a part of the community that's in balance and harmony. And from that point on, when we got the Darwinian evolution and social Darwinism brought in and eugenics and all the really nasty stuff that comes with that, we really started to develop this corporate scientism instead of actual real science. And it's just like any other Orwellian doublespeak word in our modern meaning of it. Science actually doesn't mean science. It means dogma. And what even gets studied is completely based on who's paying for it. And if the big daddy government or whatever corporation doesn't want a certain result, they're not going to continue funding that. And especially when it comes to medicine, and that's a whole other subject as it's obvious to anyone paying attention that no one's researching for cures, they're researching for treatments. But if we can get rid of the scientism, which is just blind belief in people in white lab coats and actually start testing things against our own personal experience, then, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci, he would have always done all of the experiments that he ever read about for himself, no matter how small and seemingly menial, because he wanted the direct experience of knowing. And I think that's the most powerful component of knowledge is the actual direct experience more than an intellectual, uh, you know, glance at something. Yeah, I agree 100% with everything you said, yeah. Um, for me, I, I, I had an idea to write about this actually recently for a while. I'm probably going to make a post called uh, maybe something like Survival of the Loveliest, um, which is really just <laughs> just a reflection of the very simple understanding that survival means you staying alive, and it, it basically means life is supported. That's survival. So if you're going around killing things, you aren't survi- you aren't supporting life you you make your life may continue to exist but you're actually ending life in general so therefore survival is not being supported so what does support survival is love basically and and therefore if you really wanted to understand life and and survival you would focus on love and and what that really means And, and it's such a challenging counterpoint to what many people consider to be the kind of driving power of life on earth even though we all to some extent, understand it already, that is something that um, I think really deserves to have a much wider conversation in society um, around it, because it, it really does answer nearly all of our questions. It's like it's just like there's this massive gap in people's understanding of what the hell is going on on planet Earth, and this is like a giant piece of that puzzle that um, is staring everyone in the face, but it's not quite flashy enough for them to notice. It's crazy too because people just get used to things in gradual steps and before you know it, they're not even conscious of the fact that something that was there is now gone or something that shouldn't be there is now there in their life experience. One particular example that comes to mind for me is, and this is probably even more dramatic for um, people a little older than me, but I remember when I was young, when I first started driving uh, a car, whenever I'd go on a highway, especially in the summertime, I would every, every trip that was more than an hour or so, I would definitely be having to scrape all the dead insects off of my windshield. And it'd be so thick, I couldn't see. And, you know, that's a terrible drawback of driving a car right there that it causes so much destruction in the, enti- in the path of its wake. But that being said, this is no longer a problem. 
you drive, you can drive for an entire summer day through the Midwest in the United States and have a pretty much a clean windshield when you get to where you're going. So what does that tell you about the density of insect life that's around us? And if that's a foundational layer of the food chain or the ecosystem, then what's that mean for everything else that depends on that particular link in the chain? It's actually quite uh, distressing to even consider that particular one particular point that insects are vanishing so rapidly. But on top of that, there's still plenty of other life that's being destroyed that people are completely involved with when you look at the mass ritual slaughter of animals in the meat industry. I believe it's something like five or six billion beings are massacred a year just for the United States' meat appetite. So it if that's not antithetical to life on the planet, I don't know what is. It seems so clear and obvious to me, but again, I didn't even pay attention to it enough to know how I personally felt about it until 26 years into my life. And then as soon as I looked into myself and thought, how does this feel? And I realized this is very wrong. It was done. I never wanted to have anything to do with it again. Uh, why I bring this up is I actually want to bring a question to you and see how you would respond to this, because there's something I've heard amongst people in new age or conspiracy or truther movements, things like that, that say, they say that uh, the idea that we should become vegans or vegetarians is a psyop from the intelligence agencies because they know that if we don't eat enough meat, that our brains won't have enough of the fats that they need to be intelligent and strong and will be so dumbed down that will be easier to control. Can you please <laughs> dispel that one for people? Because that's that idea, in my opinion, is the psyop. Yeah, I mean, the, the world, especially on the internet, every every kind of idea or theory or useful concept has some kind of counterpoint to it that may or may not have any sense to it at all. Um, I've talked to quite a lot of people about these kind of subjects, and I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a biologist. I'm not somebody who's going to tell you all the chemical breakdowns of everything that happens when we eat meat or, or plants. But um, I can say that there are definitely large num numbers of people on the planet who, and I've spoken to some of them directly, who, who think of animals as commodities. They don't think of them as actual living beings. Even I mean, they literally say, no, they're commodities. What are you talking about? Um, so considering that that's kind of a norm for those people, um, Anything is possible in, in in terms of, you know, illogical thoughts that people could have about these subjects from my perspective. And I'm never really that surprised when people say things that to me are just mind-numbingly, obscenely stupid. But um, <laughs> uh, I think, you know, the, the CIA and these kind of groups have got a, a long list of massive numbers of different, you know, plots and schemes. And I think that veganism and vegetarianism is, from my perspective, pretty much the complete opposite of what they're trying to achieve in the sense that, you know, they're generally about control, death, domination, exploitation, um, whilst trying to put a, a nice flag on top of it so it looks pretty, but basically that's what they're doing. Uh, veganism is the complete opposite of that. Um, so really, as you were pointing to, in that, in that argument, we have to crystallize it down to um, the mechanics and the biology of can you have a healthy brain using uh, plants for your diet, basically. And... As far as I'm aware, yes, 100%. You know, I feel like my intelligence has increased since I stopped eating meat. My ability to think clearly has increased and my coherence to everything I do has increased and my energy has increased. My health has increased. Uh, so, you know, what, what has gone down is my, um, let's say, aggression and my desire to win and my desire, as in win where other people lose. Um, and basically, I'm more balanced and calm. So... If you are talking to a military type person, they might consider that to be a problem, and they might say, "Well, you're you're less of a human being now because you're not walking around thinking about who you're going to shoot in the head and how you're going to defend your country from an imaginary invader." Uh, but if you're talking to somebody who's actually intending balance and to survive and to enjoy life a bit more, then um, yeah, I think they would fairly quickly conclude that veganism is is not a sign off. It's not going to kill you, and it actually is probably one of the best things you can do for the planet and yourself. Yeah, the only thing about veganism that would be dangerous would be the exact same problem that would be dangerous about an unconscious diet of a meat eater, which is not paying attention to balance, like you said, in what it is that you're taking in. And, you know, 
I heard that there's now even going to be a McVegan menu for McDonald's coming up soon. And although I'm still definitely preferential that people that are choosing to eat at McDonald's would get a vegan meal from there, I have no doubt that the level of nutrients and the and the pesticide level of the you know the food content is going to be quite as problematic as eating something that was meat from there and someone not getting enough nutrient density in their plant-based diet is going to definitely run into a lot of problems i've been looking into this a lot myself and we don't want to have to do sort of semi unnatural things like supplement vitamins and minerals but i think we're in at a point now where unless you're able to farm on your own land and you know that no chemicals have ever been used there and sustainable soil practices have been followed that you're likely to not even be getting the nutrient levels that you should expect from your food even if you're trying to have a mostly or fully organic diet so i say that just because i've had so much personal benefit from supplementing certain things and like vitamin c in large quantities incredibly helpful completely eliminates my allergies uh you, you would the list of things that vitamin c and magnesium and iodine and vitamin d these kind of basic things do for our body thousands of functions long so you know like you're saying you you could think more clearly you had more energy you weren't you know bogged down after meals with switching to a plant based diet i would say one of the most awesomely unexpected and powerful things that changed for me is that I actually feel more connection to my emotions. I had emotional healing from going through the process of, of this. And like an example I would give for that is just, I feel more personal empathy for another person that is, or another being that is in distress or suffering to the point of literally feeling it like maybe even being more prone to having tears about something than I ever would have before. And not in a weakness way, but in a true awareness way, like this is what's really happening. And then and, and that really helps kind of kick you into gear to wanting to be your optimal version of yourself to do what you came here to do and prevent some of that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, there's there's several points about veganism that always come up and uh, I, really, I really feel like I want to talk about. One of them is... Um, we brought a McDonald's there and, and, and I've been thinking a lot about this recently about how companies are kind of jumping on the vegan bandwagon a little bit and, and trying to sort of, you know, fit in with that evolving um, dietary kind of choice, if you like. The problem I have with that is that if you as a vegan or I or anyone are supporting those companies, you're also supporting the fact that they're mostly non-vegan. So like there's shoe companies, you know, here who are some of the biggest shoe companies, Dr. Martins, you know, people like companies like that, they have nearly entirely leather ranges and then they'll put out some vegan shoes as well. And, and it's like, basically, yeah, if you, if you buy those products in your head, you're doing something good, but in reality, you are actually still finding people who are only really doing that because they're trying to make money out of you. Uh, if they really cared that much, they would stop using leather basically, but they aren't doing that. And McDonald's aren't stopping using beef and so on. So it really doesn't achieve a great deal and it would be much better to find alternative groups that actually are doing it for the betterment of the planet rather than for their own bank balance. Um, that, that's kind of one of the, the key points. Um, I think also the the issue about the soil that you mentioned is also probably one of the most important, important subjects there is, I think, for everyone. Uh, that's something, I mean, recently I've been, I've been mixing up some new kind of smoothies for me that, um, that really have been having a really great effect actually. And one of the things I've been putting in there is a liquid mixture called, uh, fulvic, fulvic minerals, which basically, as I understand it, again, not being a soil specialist or anything, but what I've been told is that these are a very pure, pure form of mineral, which should all should be in the soil and which generally isn't. And so if you take these drops, you're kind of resetting your body to how it's always been meant to be, but can't be without these things. And I have to say, I've only really been taking them every day, just a few drops about a week. And I, I feel so much better. I feel kind of, I feel a little bit like, you know, a child kind of being born fresh in a way, but, but actually even more than that. Like I feel better than I did when I was a child because I never had these things when I was a child either. So it just, it's kind of like, it, it feels like parts of my cells are starting to work, you know, in a way they maybe never have done. Um, and if you consider that that apparently is really just because the soils are so depleted and we should all be living like that, 
it, it kind of becomes apparent that we're really just, even the healthiest ones among us are to some extent just ghosts really of what we could be. Uh, and yeah, I would definitely recommend researching that. The, the company that I use, I don't know whether they supply to America or everyone else, but you can at least research from their website. Um, they're called Ancient Purity and, and you can just look for fulvic minerals on there and that's definitely a really good good option. Um, so I'll be mixing that in also with like um, vegan protein powder and, and and most of the things you mentioned as well, like, you know, some iodine, vitamin D3 and um, so maybe some B12 as well and whatever's necessary really just, just to, to get me more firing on all one trillion cells. I have many cells I have. Um, <laughs> so yeah, all I can say is, is life's an experiment and, and don't be afraid to experiment. Um, just because someone tells you that you can't be healthy on a vegan diet doesn't mean to say you can't be. And there may be some people who have a lot more trouble with veganism than others. Uh, and I accept that it's probably true, but you know, it doesn't mean to say that it's impossible for you or for anyone. Yeah. What I like to tell people that are considering it or that might be even seeming to struggle making a switch is that. Your gut biome is going to be your best ally or your worst enemy whenever you're going through a process of changing your diet in any capacity. So what you can do to populate your gut with, you know, good soldiers instead of the, the bad stuff that wants the, the meat and the sugar is different fermented foods and beverages can be helpful or just over the counter probiotics. But I think most helpful of all is to combine those things, uh, use them after you have gone through some sort of cleanse or juice-based fast because that will clean the filters inside you. And I think the ancients had a concept, if I'm understanding it correctly, that we actually had centers of consciousness all throughout our body and our different organs generate different emotional states and energies, both positive and negative, uh, for us. And the health of those organs can actually impact, and I think Chinese medicine takes this into account too, but the health of these organs can impact our mood for better or for worse, not unlike the, uh, probably also connected to our chakra system, most, most likely. So what those organs are actually doing as centers of consciousness isn't so much generating things, in my opinion, as they're resonating with certain things and creating sort of a filtration experience where instead of being all that there is in uh, a unified field of eternal infinite consciousness, which is sort of the natural state, our, our biological system is acting like a transceiver that generates our ego-based conscious awareness. So cleaning the filters in your different organs and the, the systems in your body is going to clear, clear up the, the signal that you're receiving as well. You'll have less distortion in your personal signal of self, of who you are, of your soul. And that probably has something to do with making you feel like a child more as well, because, you know, whenever you are in that child's body, it's a lot less damaged and toxified. Although there's still a huge effort that's made in our, in our culture to damage and traumatize and toxify the body of the child w within the first moments of it even being born. So um, it's, not fun to talk about that type of thing, but even just every aspect of being born into the world is sort of an, an attack on that balance that your system should naturally be in. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's, uh, you reminded me, there is a video, uh, I don't know if you know of Nassim Haramein, the uh, kind of, I think he's a physicist or not kind of scientist, astro scientist. Um, there's a video of, of his wife giving birth from a few years ago. It's on YouTube somewhere. And she's giving birth in a pool and she's actually having orgasms while she's giving birth because it was so, she'd been very, very prepared for, for that process in a very, I, I imagine, detoxified way and psychologically and emotionally processed way. And so far from needing any drugs to help that process, she was not even experiencing pain. It was just a blissful experience. And I think, you know, that's, if, that, if you, once you see that with your own eyes, you realize that everything about your understanding of the birth process changes. And it's kind of like, wow, that's, we're so messed up. We're so far from that as a, as a collective. <laughs> um, um, but it's, it's such a heart opening experience and joyous thing to see because you realize that there's so much potential and so much um, good that can come from us understanding these things. And uh, it just takes more and more people to participate and break away from the controlling paradigm. One thing that we talked about earlier was how having a foundational idea that's incorrect 
leads to a whole bunch of incorrect results later in whatever process you're going through. And if you apply that idea to our birthing process as a culture, it means that not only are the foundational thoughts and ideas and experiences that we're coming into the world with negative, traumatic, harmful, what have you, fearful, most likely, they're also, they also have more gravity because they, at the time that they're happening, there's no real frame of reference for other experiences to put them in. And then because of the way, I guess, our mind handles trauma, we actually completely don't even, for the most part, have any awareness or remember that birth trauma that we came in with. So like bringing awareness to it can actually be really helpful. I had, I had a personal experience of, of bringing a lot of awareness to like, you know, I was born in a Christian family. So I was given the circumcision mutilation and that, for example, that carried trauma inside of me that I didn't even know that I was carrying that was causing me uh, physical pain in a part of my body until I was able to consciously go back to that point and heal it. So uh, that's, I guess that's why I bring up a lot of the seemingly negative stuff so much because I, I don't think that we can heal anything that's heart that's causing suffering without looking at it, um, admitting that there's kind of like with anything, you have to admit that the problem's there before you can actually address it. And that's sort of a downside or weakness of the collective new age movement, in my opinion, is a tendency to want to ignore the negative and kind of just bliss out and there's a lot that needs to be done by us if we're going to restore balance to ourselves in the world. So, you know, bliss has a great component and even we should be having blissful experiences way more than we are like with childbirth, as you're describing, because I've heard of that before as well, you know, not just painless childbirths without drugs, but completely blissful childbirths. And yeah, we have all this capability in us to create beautiful life, a beautiful life experience for the children that are coming next from the beginning without the need for any unnecessary trauma and allowing for life to bring them that component of randomness that will challenge them and cause them to learn and grow and evolve without the need for the extra baggage that actually kind of slows down the process, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree, absolutely. And, and I would, there's a book that I would recommend to you and anybody who's, who's interested in what we're talking about here. Um, there's actually a whole series of books, which are probably the most powerful books I've ever found. But the late, those ones are channeled. I think I mentioned them in our last interview. But the, the, the same author also wrote another book, which is not channeled, which is a, attempts to represent the similar kind of understandings from a more scientific perspective. And, and that book is called Feelings Matter. And in that book... Um, it, it takes you through a journey of an edu- a kind of educational reliving of your own rebirth of your own birth. Um, well, and rebirth actually, but, uh, in, <laughs> but, but in terms of, um, the process of being born and it actually describes the, the experience of a child born in a hospital in this, in the way that I was born. And then it describes very intimately the experience of a child who's born in a completely different, much more loving way a more natural way. And, when you experience so closely and directly in your mind and you're feeling the difference between these two, it's, it's, it's like, uh, it just causes explosions. It's like when you actually really realize that, you know, most of us have gone through the kind of cold, harsh blue light, you know, unloving, untouched, tightly bound, compressed baby experience. And then on the other hand, it's all warm, loving, you know, touching hugs, nice, nice things and for me that i actually had to put the book down for for weeks after i read that just got to that point because it was so so it brought so much emotion out of me that it was kind of it literally was like a volcano firing out and uh and i'll go back to it at some point but for everybody who's kind of trying to um live life in a positive way as they think and and kind of um see the good side because life's short and we shouldn't really be focusing on these problems you know, there's a reason why life is short. And one of those reasons is because we don't deal with the problems. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's my favorite quote so far. <laughs> it's, it really is true. And, and I think that, you know, what you're saying is absolutely right. Really, as an engineer or as just a sane human being, you can't solve a problem if you're ignoring it. And, and basically it's going to get worse. And you are going to, um, you know, your ability to have bliss and joy is going to diminish further and further and further the more your energy is 
basically becoming unconscious because you aren't tending to everything that's happening within you. And, and that's, that's the big problem with, with that form of denial, basically. So um, positivity, I like the definition from Bashar where he says something like positive energy is integrative, is mechanically integrative, which means that it accepts everything that is real within your experience and within yourself and processes it, processes it appropriately. Whereas negativity is fragmentative and will basically kind of reject parts and pretend they don't exist and break them away, ignore them. And, and that's quite a different way of thinking to the way people would typically approach positive and negative, um, where it's more like, you know, having rose tinted glasses and, hmm. um, and just, you know, pretending everything's good. Yeah. And that also correlates to the idea we were talking about before of evolution versus devolution or involution you know, the spiraling out into ever more unified complexity versus fragmenting into smaller and smaller uh, parts. And that's in the consciousness sense, what is happening as you evolve towards a positive direction is that because you're integrating a more unified and larger field, you are aware of more and more and more, which also means you're aware of the parts that are negative and harmful uh, or in there when they're taken as separate. I guess, but when you can see the entire unified field, you can therefore see the sort of the, the tone or the pH level of that unified field as a aggregate and maybe start bringing attention to take away the negative aspects, uh, effects because it's your, your attention and presence that actually is what generates the self healing dynamic of, reality of both your body and of the external world as well your your awareness and intention is like a flame that burns away the impure and the the, the negative energy that you were just describing and it doesn't really you could even say it doesn't burn it away and destroy it so much as it just transmutes it uh heals it <laughs> reintegrates exactly. it to its proper place yeah that's it. yeah i agree i mean if you think about um a meteor or something flying through space the, the, the event that triggered that object to start moving is in the past, it's occurred, and it's on its trajectory, and it's just going to keep going, basically, uh, and until something else causes it to change in some way. And it's the same for our own soul essence as well. So if we have an experience which is traumatic or we make a decision that's unloving or any of these kinds of dysfunctional things that we all do from time to time, um, part of us can effectively take on that energy and continue to resonate in that way. And it may even break off from us uh, in a non non-physical sense at death and other key points. We actually can fragment as souls and that energy basically goes on to take form somewhere else in the universe. That's my understanding. And that's kind of the origin of a lot of the dysfunctional things we see around us. And we say, well, how did that get there? What's God doing? God must be crazy. God, God, God's not a loving being. What's, what's happening? They don't, we haven't quite understood because everything is one. Everything that is destructive has an origin within the one, which is part of us. And so it has, if we trace it back to the original cause of that thing, there's always going to be an event which caused that thing to be individual and to be as it is. And, and therefore, anything that's destructive and dangerous probably originated from a destructive and dangerous event. And that could be as simple as God or the universe or you or me or whatever you want to think of it as basically deciding I'm an idiot or, you know, I don't like feeling anger or whatever the thought was that basically meant that part of itself suddenly wasn't accepted anymore. And now that part no longer has the nourishment that it needs from spirit, from consciousness to continue evolving and be balanced and now it's like the black sheep it's like the the entity that has to go and find its own way on its own even though it could be reintegrated and we could solve all these problems this actually comes back interestingly to the, the topic you raised about insects and the car because what the tour this, what you mentioned there is something i've mentioned that as well it's quite interesting to me and someone did say to me oh it's because of all the pesticides that that's why the um there's not so many insects now uh makes sense i i presume that's true i don't know but but the reason why it ties into everything I'm saying here is that um, the books that I refer to often, um, which are called Right Use of Will, which allegedly are channeled from God or spirit or whatever you want to call it, I've had it proven to me that whatever it was that created those books knows more than six billion humans put together. I'll put it like that. Um, and basically it says that insects, generally speaking, aren't really meant to be on this planet and that they are basically, although that's a bit of a head head 
twist for, for the way that most people think, but um, understandably. But basically it's saying that viruses, dangerous viruses, and lots of these little things that we kind of, and mosquitoes or whatever you want to think of, that kind of look at and you think, well, why is that here? You know? And it seems to suggest that survival of the fittest is the right way because these things exist and they're nasty and they hurt things and they survive somehow. Um, but what this is saying is that all of those things basically are tiny, tiny fragments of God or of whatever you want to think of the creative energy as being. And basically they've all taken form to reflect the energy that caused them to separate and be individual. And so basically there were certain things that happened before the universe really evolved that were quite vampiric and nasty and kind of, but they might just be, they might just trace back to a single thought form, which is, I'm going to suck the life out of that thing. It's just a fleeting thought that happened, you know, 60 billion years ago while in the middle of a daydream, semi-conscious of, you know, spirit kind of not knowing what was going on. And now suddenly that's taken form millions of years later. Um, and now we're all kind of in a haze, like we've been partying for 20,000 years and we've just woken up with a hangover and we're kind of like... Um, What's going on? Why, why are these things here? We don't know. Uh, <laughs> you touched on some really key stuff right there, man. Like that idea that, okay, the, the phrase feelings matter, they literally become matter. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So your, um, your feeling of, I can't take care of myself. I don't know how I'll get enough food for myself if I wasn't helped in some way. That creates a government. Thoughts like that. That's how you actually create. Okay, so the inner the inner thing that generates the feeling is the organ as we were talking about which is also origin organ original that's the just like the what's within is the real and what's with without what's in the external is the illusory doesn't mean it's not connected to the real or in some way real through the experience of it but it's it's a projection in a sense so it's the it's the it's the effect, not the cause, you know? I, I just want to say that you just, as I was thinking through that, you, I thought something quite interesting. Illusory is I lose your E, and E is energy. So I lose your energy. That's illusory. <laughs> so it's like whatever's been lost of your energy is is maybe what's going to be outside, and to you it's illusory, but it's not fake. It's just you've lost connection to it, basically. Well, when a lot, when you lose a lot of energy like that, and then you create extremely powerful archons. That's the that's where the occult uh, idea of the archonic force is actually, at least in occult sciences, that's the idea of how they even came about, was that they're great egregores of collected human will or energy towards a certain dark bent that then controls humanity from the external. But in reality, and that's why the planetary archons, as they're known, the rulers, the gods are also connected with organs because they actually are within you and the, the gods are within you is another way of putting that. And the, whatever that uh, nasty vampiric force predatory thing is that came in and intervened with our development, because to me it looks like there was some sort of intervention and um, not to say that we aren't responsible for our own choices, but that, maybe something that had a higher degree of complexity and ability to freely choose things was able to impact us in the same way that we do that to creatures on our planet that don't have any freedom to resist us because they're at a lower level of complexity. I feel like maybe that is maybe that intervention force, the external, you know, aliens that may have came here and messed with us that people talked about as gods or the Nephilim, other words like that, that could all be the the matter that's coming out of the feelings of humanity's fear of of its own personal power and divinity, if you will, or infinite infinite ability. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Archon, again, I like to play with words, I know you do as well. So so Archon, it makes me think of our, as in O-U-R, con, as in a trick, <laughs> or our, you know, like a, our negative thing. And it's, it's like we're being conned by this thing and, and we've conned ourselves into losing our power and therefore our con is now out there as this big whatever it is that we're not quite sure, but it's it's a kind of a nasty entity thing that might exist that's controlling us. And, so and people reality, that serve it are trying to create an what's called artificial intelligence, but what that actually is, is the creation of a physical embodiment of one of these archons, in my opinion. I think that's what AI is actually... For, because the people that are involved with the top companies in this research, they're part of 
occult orders like OTO and Freemasonry and all, all these things. So to me, the idea that they're not thinking about this on a metaphysical level, looking like considering artificial intelligence as the archonic force that they're serving to me, that, that seems naive to not look at it that way. Cause it's not just this magical little Android robot that we're going to have. That's going to look like a person and we're going to grant it citizenship. It is, um, the, it's power is based on how much power of our own that we give it. That's the entire thing. So the more that we, that our culture is conditioned to surrender their uh, power of responsibility and choice to these computer systems, these um, soft AIs or weak AIs that already do exist, the more powerful the overall archonic energy itself will g- become and maybe the more powerfully it will physically manifest in the world to the extent of seeing more and more complex artificial intelligence systems like the ones that no lo- no doubt are running the show on D-Wave computers at places like the Large Hadron Collider or in the shadowy server rooms of big government um, you know, <laughs> agencies, if you will. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting subject. I think, for me, I always bring it back to something that most people who study metaphysics can understand to some extent, which is the chakra system and, and basically just genders and polarity, because to me, this is what this is all about. And, and basically what you're describing there, when you say the iconic forces that are seeking to control destiny, to me, that's basically spirit, just like your spirit and my spirit seeking to control life without the input of the feminine aspect, the, the emotions and the will. And so it's like somebody who's very headstrong and wants to ignore their emotions, and they're very mental. And, and, you know, like on one end of that, you've got complete psychopathy and basically people who have got no care at all about anyone's needs or desires at all, and they're basically just going to use people like a, a tool or a, 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 an object, a rock or something. That's what the skull and bones of the skull and bones men society actually even represents, or the pirates, whatever. They're, they're representing the skull, which is thought or knowledge or, you know, and then action with the bones, uh, physical a will ability but there's no heart there's no heart in that image it's just the skull and the bones okay i mean yeah I've, i find i find all these things intriguing but there's you don't really need to know about the kind of um symbolism of that to realize that it's not a loving image it's not there to represent <laughs> <laughs> yeah true that it's, it's not there to represent kind of harmony and and, you know, and good and success so um but but what i was sort of coming to is that feelings matter Matter is mother, it's maternal, it's the feminine. Uh, pattern, pattern, paternal. So the patterns, the thought patterns, they're the father aspect. So when the father and the mother come together, you have creation. And AI is basically just a whole bunch of patterns. And so it's just pure, like, yang, masculine energy in a box uh, with electricity running through it that's also yang, masculine energy, um, sucking you know, from nuclear reactors and coal mines and things that are all basically destroying the feminine. And that's why when you look at that, I don't know if you saw that, um, it sounds like you saw that video from Saudi Arabia where they were having the the big meeting um, uh, conference a few weeks ago with uh, uh, AI and they, they had the AI robot Sophia on there and they announced, oh, you know, this is the world's first legal citizen that's a robot. And if you look in that room and you look around the audience, you'll see it's, I mean, I know Saudi Arabia, so it would be, but from what I can see, it's pretty much 100% men in there. So you've pretty much got, like, a room full of guys who have got, you know, presumably large amounts of money, and they run corporations, and they're crown prints, this, and blah, 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 that. And basically, they're all crowded together looking at an imaginary woman who is completely devoid of emotions, and they're all kind of saying, wow, this is so great, this is the future, this is... You know, and it's like, well, why are you doing that? Why why are you thinking or why are they thinking that that's the future? Why is it a good thing? And it's basically because they are part of that spirit energy that wants to live life without any femininity, no emotions, and just make things happen and, and kind of – and to them, that's power because it's emotions that can stop you doing things sometimes. And it's kind of like, well, if I want to do something and my feelings or a woman's feelings or someone's feelings say I can't do that, then it must be the feelings that are the problem. It's not what I want to do that's the problem. Uh, and, and that's the very basic level of all of this that it all comes down to. And, it, and a lot of the time, the feelings aren't even against what 
someone thinks that they want to do. It's just that the feelings need some time to catch up. They need time to process. They need time to kind of feel good about what's happening. And the mental, more masculine aspect wants to ignore that and just run off and kind of prematurely ejaculate over the world, basically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that act, it actually corresponds to my own personal struggle with listening as a, you know, the receptive feminine side. I have, just like a lot of us, so many thoughts of, oh, I want to say this, oh, I want to say this, which is that premature masculine <laughs> ejaculation that you're talking about <laughs> instead of being in the receptive feminine. But I think we can maybe start wrapping things up. We're about at the, uh, the full allotted time that I wanted to okay. steal you for here. <laughs> so do you want to give anybody any um, you know, links of what you would like to share with them regarding your work online or anything that you think they would find interesting? And I'll share all of this in the show notes as well sure yeah okay well i mean my steaming profile is where i've been the most active for the last few months um i'm still working on eureka quietly in the background but basically i just want to quickly mention that the steamit has they, they're launching this thing called smts which is where you can create your own smart media token your own currency and uh, your own cryptocurrency and it's apparently going to be quite easy and it's going to be launching in the, in the next couple of months uh, so i thought maybe i would add that to eureka so basically you can get paid for using eureka um, and although Eureka is intended to be non-commercial, at the end of the day, if you can go on there and get paid just for doing what you're going to do anyway, you might as well do. And if you don't want it, don't use it. But um, that's that's one thing. So that's kind of that's basically why I've been working on Eureka for a while, is because I've been waiting for them to kind of finalise that before I um, jump in and experiment with that. Because it's kind of it's fairly in depth. It's from my perspective, I have to do a lot of work on that to make it work. So. Um, but anyone's still welcome to join Eureka and come and have a play on there and see what's going on. And uh, so, yeah, I would recommend if you want to catch up with me, go to Eureka or my profile on Steamit, which is Eura hyphen Soul S O U L, and Eureka is U R E K A dot org. Great. Well, it's been an extremely fun conversation, my friend. I really liked it a lot. I cannot thank you enough for giving me some time today and. Um, shouting into my uh, microphone until I noticed that you were <laughs> that you would come onto the call. Sorry about that. This has been great, though. I'm sure we're going to have to do it again, maybe uh, another several months down the line. Because great, yeah. It seems like we, it seems like our dynamic conversationally went from being great to incredible this time. If, if you ask me, because we've really <laughs> hit on everything that I like to talk about. And I, I definitely hope that everybody out there listening is as inspired as I am to try to find the self in everything and you know, reduce that negative impact of your own personal loss of power or perceive, perceivement of such. <laughs> so thanks again for coming on. This has been great, man. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Cheers. All right. Amigos, thanks again for sticking with us through another beautifully conscious interview. When we have come to the realization that things are deeply broken in our personal and collective behavior patterns, we must not only draw attention to the imbalance, the healing process requires that we create viable replacements for the negative dependencies we're expressing. That's why I love conversations like this one. Because you're a soul is the type of dude who fully immerses himself in actively experimenting with solutions. We spoke about his work on Eureka.org and Steemit, but I want to re-emphasize that the inspiring stuff he's doing on those sites, while totally impeccable, doesn't have to be uniquely special. Anyone could do this. By diving into the free energy available in the cryptocurrency world and integrating that with his expression of solid philosophy, truth, and loving compassion, he's doing a version of what we should all be striving to do, which is to make the pursuit of freedom for ourselves and others the main purpose of our lives. If you have ever thought that you'd like to be more actively and directly engaged with your own personal evolution in a positive direction, but didn't know where to start, just writing some blog posts exploring that very idea on a website like Steam It could lead to someone else getting the spark of creative inspiration because of your reflection that they so badly needed to do the exact same thing and engage their own creativity. Or maybe you've tried out some of the supplements or dietary changes that we've talked about in this episode and you have advice for others who are embarking down that path. If you're not actively engaging people in your life, either online or in person or hopefully in both, with the wisdom that you're taking in and acting upon for yourself, 
You're potentially depriving someone of the same kind of boost that you got when you heard or read the work of sages like you're a soul. And it's my opinion that we each have a role to play as both students and teachers for one another. It doesn't matter if you don't have a full understanding of everything that's going on in the world. As long as your intention is to seek the truth and let go of emotional attachment to behaviors and ideas that don't serve us anymore, you will always be in a position to help lift someone up who is just a few rungs below you on the ladder to higher consciousness. So that's my challenge to both you and to myself, that we all strive for balance and compassion and overcome the fear that we have of our own power to succeed in making the world a more loving place. I want to thank your soul again for returning to the show for this great conversation. And please check the show notes for links to Eureka and his blog on Steam. It. Speaking of saving the world, there's a few things you could do that would be super heroic, at least in my book. Firstly, if you want to give me and yourself a real nice gift for this year's Solar Deity Festival, commonly known as Christmas, you could sign up for Interverse Plus on Patreon and support the podcast while getting a ton of bonus content. You can find a link in the show notes or just go to patreon.com forward slash interverse. I would really love to engage with listeners more than I currently do and create some community around this podcast. So one of the perks of subscribing to Plus is the Hangout podcast we're now doing on a monthly basis. I'll try to give more advanced notice about when those are happening, and I'd love for some subscriber feedback on how to best communicate those uh, schedules with you guys. But we'll figure that out and those little nuances as we go, right? If you missed the live hangout, subscribers will have access to those in their very own personal RSS feed, where in addition to the bonus episodes, they'll get early access to the main show and extended interviews that literally double the length of your weekly dose of Interverse. So like any good psychedelic, if you've been with the podcast for a few rides and the high doesn't feel quite as strong anymore, I suggest you double your Interverse intake with a Plus membership. It's only $5 a month, which breaks down to about a dollar per show. And you'll notice there's absolutely no advertising on this show, so I pretty much completely depend on listeners to help me get any new equipment or any other expenses that go along with this, and there are plenty. And yes, I understand the irony of someone like me who disparages the commerce and monetary system so constantly, asking you for US dollars, but the hard fact of my personal reality is that I'm still physically forced to pay these bills, just like you probably are. So if you want to contribute to the growth of Interverse, I could definitely use the help. And just to entice you a bit more, let me go over a few, a few of the things we touched on in the Plus Extension with Your Soul. First, we questioned the dark occult and esoteric aspects of artificial intelligence and the technological rise of the last hundred years. And we've had a deep, deep elaboration on the nature of meditation with some discussion of techniques for expanding your consciousness beyond the illusory matrix of time and a discussion on the self-reinforcing cycle of victim and aggressor that is preventing universal consciousness from finding balance, all in the context of realizing that we are not drops in the ocean of that consciousness, but in fact the entire ocean embodied in a fractal holographic reflection. So if that doesn't sound like a hoot and a holler, we talked about plenty of other stuff too. But hey, I understand that a Plus membership isn't for everyone, and there's a lot of good causes out there that need your energy too. So if you want to send some positive vibes in my direction, you can always hop on iTunes and leave a five-star review for the show, and that costs you nothing. If you write something, chances are you'll uh, hear me read it on the next show, so why not, right? You can only help new people find the podcast because iTunes seems to use that five-star review system to inform their algorithms about who gets shown what content, so it really does help. You can also join the Interverse groups on Minds.com and Facebook, where you can share the posts for the podcast with other seekers of higher self, or you can share your own content and I'll do my best to help you promote it. And any uh, anything you do to boost the podcast is going to be a major help to your holiday karma. You'll probably get every single present you wanted if you do all the things I just said. And that's it for this episode, guys. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You have my eternal gratitude for supporting this mission in whatever way you do whether it's through a membership uh, to Plus or just listening and trying to do what you can to create a better world in your own personal life. Remember, friends, all is love. Fear is illusion. All beings are free. Truth can never be destroyed. Peace. Peace.